I'm trying to get harder and tougher mentally and physically every day of my life. You're either the growth mindset or you're the fixed mindset. If you're trying to be the best, you need to look at who the best is and see what they do. Relentless pursuit of progress. There's a difference between the best and the rest and the rest. Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast. Champions are built in the mind first. Where we interview scientists, world champions, doctors and experts in just about every area of health and fitness. What do you care enough about? What are you fascinated enough about to go so deep and learn so much that you'll know more about it than anyone else? And now, here's your host, Michael Cashew. Michael Cashew. Hey, this is Michael Cashew, and today I'm talking to a guy named James Krieger. Giant James is a scientist focused on weight loss and muscle gain, and he's the owner of a company called Weightology. At the beginning of the show, we talk about a commonly held belief, which is that adherence to a plan is the most important factor in success. So adherence to a diet, actually sticking to the diet, is way more important than what diet you pick. And so we talk about a lot of obstacles that get in people's way to actually sticking to their diets and adhering to the plan. We talk about diet wars and the pros and cons of believing that your diet is the best diet, the only diet, and the diet that everyone should be on. We talk about palatability and how to tinker with how your food tastes to reach your goals faster. We talk about the importance of your environment on reaching your goals. So the people in it and the types of food that you're surrounding yourself with. We finish off by talking about something that James is really passionate about, which is thinking about his own thinking. So we go into confirmation bias and some other fallacies and thinking errors. This one was a super fun episode for me. James is a, uh, he's just a great thinker and he's a really clear thinker and very down to earth. And so he has this ability to explain really uh, high level principles and pull on all of the research that he's doing and explain it in a really palatable way, really understandable way. So without further ado, please help me welcome James Krieger. This episode is also brought to you by Jumbo CBD. If you're not already on the CBD train, then I'm sure you've at least heard of it before because many people thought in the beginning that this was just a legal way to get high. And unfortunately for some of you, you can't get high on CBD. You can try, but you can't get high on it. On the other hand, it can help you sleep better. It can reduce stress and anxiety. It can be huge for pain relief and reducing inflammation. Personally, I've had knee pain for about five years now, and I haven't been able to figure out a way to get rid of it. I haven't, I haven't figured out the root cause. I've worked with PTs and chiropractors, and I just haven't been able to eradicate it. So I have used some pain relieving techniques, and this is one of them. I've used Jumbo's extra strength, um, 200 milligram balm, and it absolutely does not completely take the pain away, but it makes it manageable. Uh, it allows me to get in a, into a deeper squat. It allows me to walk around and just go about my daily activities without feeling much pain at all. And whether that's placebo or not, I really don't care because I just don't feel like I'm in as much pain. I've also used their sprays and there's a really subtle relaxing effect to the sprays. Um, so that's, that's pretty great. Uh, it's helpful for sleep and reduces a little bit of like a feeling of tension in my chest, which I often call anxiety. Uh, it's great for af athletes and recovery and some specifics and what sets Jumbo apart is that they have a hundred percent natural ingredients, full spectrum CBD sourced from Colorado and Oregon. Uh, they have CO2 extracted oils that are, I think, safer. Uh, they have therapeutic grade essential oils in a lot of their products, third party lab tested, so it's legit. And they're one of the first CBD companies to post their lab results publicly. Uh, I also know the owners of this company very well. They're very close friends of mine, and I trust them deeply. 
Uh, again, my favorite product of theirs is the 200 milligram extra strength balm. I've also used the sprays, but they also have drops and butters or ghee. I think ghee is like a, a butter type thing. Um, so there's all sorts of different products and they're offering you 15% off of anything in their store. And you can get access to that by going to jambocbd.com and use the code BRUTE in all caps. That's B-R-U-T-E in all caps. Uh, a couple more things. So a huge plus of their sprays and drops is that they use MCT oil. So since CBD is a fat soluble molecule, it binds with this oil and allows for much more rapid and effective absorption of the actual CBD. It also has essential oils that add flavor and they bring their own proven health benefits as well. With the muscle bomb, since they they use ghee as the base, again, ghee is like a butter type thing. The CBD is binding with the ghee fat and it's able to be carried all the way to the bones. Ghee itself has amazing topical healing properties and when CBD is added, the results can be pretty profound. So again, you can get access to this discount, 15% off of all of their products by going to jambocbd.com and enter the code B-R-U-T-E, all caps, at checkout. Go get them. James, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to finally be here with you today. So for those of the listeners that don't know you already, how do you explain what you do today? <laughs> I wear a lot of different hats, but uh, um, I would say I'm a scientist. You know, I've published research in the exercise and nutrition field. Um, I'm also a coach. I have clients that I work with who I, you know, I've you know, helped people for years losing weight and everything like that. Uh, I'm a thinker, you know, I uh, just spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the fitness industry and, you know, where things can be improved and how to help people better and, and also just all the fallacies and crap that gets, you know, circulated about, you know. Um, and then I think a lot about uh, finances in a lot of different ways, not just for myself, but also just you know, I, I think, uh, I think the people in the fitness field sometimes don't necessarily have a very good grasp of that topic. And, mm -hmm. and so it's also something I'm very passionate about. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a lot of different things. I'm, I'm, I'm a big research nerd. Um, in fact, I have like a research review that I, uh, kind of try to dumb down research for people. So, um, that's actually a big, probably chunk of what I do as well. I, actually it is. I mean, I, um, uh, you know, even as we speak this morning before I got on with you, I was working on the next issue of my research review. So, uh, so yeah, that's, I kind of have a lot of different hats that I'm wearing. So something we're going to talk a, a good bit about today is this idea of thinking about your thinking, which is something you're super passionate about. And we'll talk in more detail about it, especially towards the end of the show, but to whom or what do you attribute this characteristic to? Like where, where did, where did I kind of yeah. get that? Like, um, it kind of came from just reading some books. I mean, I mean, I've always been somewhat of a critical thinker, but, uh, but as I developed as a scientist, as years went on, um, I actually started reading books on thinking and actually, you know, one influential book, uh, that I read quite a long time ago was a book. It was called. Um, how we know what isn't so, and I think the author's name was Thomas Gilovich, I think, and it was a really fascinating book to me, um, because it, it, it made you think differently about what, what a lot of people just kind of take for granted in terms of thinking. So like a perfect example that I remember from that book is, you know, you're watching basketball and someone hits a bunch of shots in a row and some people will say, oh, he's got the hot hand. So get him the ball. You know, he's got the hot hand, you know, you, you'll shoot it. And Thomas Gilvich, basically, he, he challenged this whole concept of the hot hand. And because this idea that someone has a hot hand mean it implies that if if um, if the, if someone makes a shot they are actually more likely to make their next shot. You know, like they're on, they're on a hot hand, they're on a hot streak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and he actually investigated this statistically um, because if, 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 if something like the hot hand truly exists, 
then there should be patterns in in um, in how in when people hitting shots that would be they'll hit more shots in a row than you would deem just by chance, right? right? And basically, he basically discovered that the whole hot hand thing doesn't exist. It's a total illusion. You know, um, anyone that does go on a streak, it's well within the the realm of just random chance based on whatever someone's shooting percentage is, you know? So, so the hot hand, it looks like someone's hot, but really j- what you're just seeing is just just random streaks of noise that are really within someone's typical shooting percentage, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um and it was that really influenced my thinking as to start to think about things differently. Um, you know, he had another example where just in terms of coin flips, um, if you flip a coin, you know, a bunch of times in a row and you give someone the results, of, let's say you did it like a hundred times in a row and you give someone the results of those coin flips, um, it will actually look a lot streakier than what you might expect. Most people, you know, you know, a coin flips a 50, 50. Most people don't anticipate that you're actually going to see patterns in that more often than not. And and you might actually see patterns there that don't even exist and mm-hmm. uh, th- th- that are just there by random chance. Um, and, and that also just influenced my thinking a lot. Um, and, and even things like, uh, coincidence you know people tend to um establish they they tend to um place a lot of meaning on what are ultimately coincidental events and and something that also influenced me was just how likely it is for really even odd coincidences to happen and so one perfect example is if you have i think it's 30 people in a room the probability of two of those people having the same birthday was actually fairly high. I, I don't remember what it was. It was something like 60 or 70% or something no like shit. that. So, so, so it was just like stuff like that is something I think that one book, I think really started to transform the way I think about things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of led, I mean, I think led, it, it really has changed the way it um, transformed the way I think about things now, you know? So, I love the example about the uh, the hot hands. And what comes to mind for me, though, is slumps in baseball. Yeah. How, how does that uh, how does that relate? Because it seems like there's definitely a psychological factor I, at play. Yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt that there probably is a psychological factor at play. And maybe that plays a role in slump, especially if a batter starts to like, let's say if the batter starts to adjust their technique or starts to do something differently than what they did before, Mm -hmm. um, then I would say then perhaps there's something, you know, there could be a psychological aspect behind those slumps. Um, now otherwise though, if a batter, if he's not doing anything differently, um, you know, if he's in a slump, um, it, it could just be within the uh, the realms of just random probability. Again, you know, uh, like I said, it's just um, s- streaks happen a lot more often by just by chance than what people might think. Mm-hmm. You know, whether mm-hmm. it's winning streaks or losing streaks or whatever. You know, yeah. um, and that that really happens in br- really all aspects of life. Really, um, so I even think about it in terms of my, my stock trading that I like to do. It's like, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I probably about 70% of my trades are winning trades, but I still have losing streaks, you know, and, and sometimes I'll, I'll get a bunch of losers in a row and I'll, you know, it, it starts to bother me, but I have to remind myself that this is actually a, a normal within the probabilities of, of whether, whatever trading, you know, strategies I'm using. So, yeah. um, so, yeah, and I, I even think in terms of you can look at it in terms of weight loss, too, like um, people kind of in terms of weight loss, you know, I think when people want to lose weight and get healthier, they expect everything to just happen in a linear fashion just to be losing weight every single week and, and everything like that. And and then if they have a week or two where they don't lose any body weight, they they panic or they think something's wrong. And the reality is, is that even if you're doing everything exactly right, you're going to have weeks or two, you know, you know, little streaks here and there where you don't lose any weight or maybe even your weight, body weight goes up a little bit. And that's partly because body weight's very finicky, you know, because of a variety of reasons like 
sodium intake and water retention and, you know, changes in menstrual cycle for women and all that stuff. But, um, <clears throat> but, but I think you can apply that into the fitness realm that, you know, just cause you see it, you're on a short term quote unquote losing streak. And I would say in terms of weight loss, that means, you know, your weight loss has stopped for a couple weeks and you start to think something's wrong. And the thing is, there probably isn't anything wrong. You know, if you, if you keep at it, you're mm-hmm. probably going to start to see a downtrend again at some point. So, right. um, you know, that's assuming you're being adherent and everything. Now, if, if someone has lost dietary adherence and all that stuff, then, then that's different. But, but if someone is being adherent and they see, they run into a plateau, really, it's just kind of, you just got to stay the course um, and, and really give it a, a fair shake before you start to think that, okay, maybe I need to fix or change something, you know? Right. Yeah. Another one, I think I was reading about this yesterday. I think it's called the same effect fallacy. <clears throat> so when people lose <laughs> say 10 pounds and they, maybe they did that by getting off the couch and they started working out two days a week and they started, tracking their protein, right? They, they took two small actions and that allowed them to lose the first 10 pounds. They think that same exact action is what's going to help them lose the next 10 pounds. And it might, oh, yeah. but it also might not. And we, 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 we have this fallacy in all sorts of areas of our life, but that one comes up all the time in fitness. Oh, oh yeah. And, 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 and just from, from a biological perspective, uh, when you think in terms of, of equilibrium, you know, you establish an energy deficit and you start to lose weight and you're like, great, I'm in a deficit and everything. I'm losing weight and stuff. Um, but eventually you're going to reach a new equilibrium. And, and once you reach that new equilibrium, you're not going to lose any further weight until you reestablish a deficit, mm-hmm. you know, and whether that's be increasing your activity even more or dropping your calories or something like that. Um, you know, that's just, that's just basic physics at work there, mm-hmm. you know? So so you started out in computer science in the '90s, and then switched over to fitness. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, obviously never. I had never anticipated my career taking that direction. Um, yeah, I was a I was a pretty much a computer nerd uh, growing up. Uh, you know, I, I started teaching myself computer programming in like seventh grade, sixth seventh grade, and. By high school, I had taught myself like C programming and assembly language programming for Intel processors and all this stuff and like uh, read computer magazines and and that was going to be my career. I wanted, you know, I I live in the Seattle area and Microsoft is obviously the big Mm -hmm. computer uh, um, employer here, uh, software employer, and, and that's who I wanted to work for. I wanted to work for Microsoft and everything. And um and then when I graduated high school, I was so, I, you know, I, I was, again, your stereotypical computer nerd. I was super skinny, uh, really just lanky and skinny and stuff. And I was like, well, I'd, I wanted to add some muscle. And so I started weight training. I had no idea what I was doing. And I started reading the bodybuilding magazines, you know, muscle and fitness and flex and muscular development and all those. And uh, what was Ro- Robert Kennedy's magazine? What was that? Muscle Mag International. And, uh, um, but what I found is when I read those magazines, uh, the part that always interested me the most was there would always be a, something about some scientific studies, right? They'd, whether they, whether it be a few pages on some recent research or whatever, that, that's what I always found the most interesting. Um, and so then I started getting on like email forums, uh, that were related to fitness and weight training and bodybuilding. And, and I would get in discussions with people and, my interest in that just kind of overtook me. Um, and I, I just started to really lose a lot of interest in computer science. And the problem with in computers is like, if you lose interest in it, you're dead because like the computer field advances so fast. Um, you know, everything that I knew from high school, you know, even two years into college was already somewhat obsolete, you know, and I just wasn't keeping up with it anymore. And I, I kind of just lost my passion for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of showed in that I, I wasn't able to get in the computer science department at University of Washington. So I transferred to the rival school, Washington State University, on the other side of the state and uh, got in the computer science department there. But like two years into it, I was just I wasn't interested in what I was doing. I wasn't studying. And they had an exercise science department there. And I had when one of my buddies was like, dude, you know, you're you uh, you're obviously more interested in this stuff. And. And so I decided, well, if I'm going to make a change, it's kind of now or never. And so I, 
Um, and I thought, well, I can always go back and finish my computer science degree if this doesn't work out. And so I changed my major, basically started school all over again because it's a radically different field. Right. Now I had to, you know, take biology and physiology classes and, you know, all that math and other stuff that I had to have from computer science didn't matter anymore. Um, started there. I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, you know, um, I just thought, well, let's just do this and see where it goes. And eventually, you know, one professor was like, you know, you should, I think you're really smart. You should go for your PhD and stuff. And so I kind of went down that road. Um, that's a whole nother story, but I, I never finished my PhD. I, that's why I ended up with two master's degrees instead. But, uh, but yeah, it's, um, but that's how I kind of transitioned from the computer science field to uh, the fitness field. So, so how did you, how did you come to narrow your niche down to weight loss? Your company is called Weightology. How did you come to that narrow focus? Um, it, um, well, I would say I'm not just focused. It, I would say my, my company Weightology, it, it kind of play, the name plays on two different things. It, it definitely plays on weight loss, but it also, uh, plays on the idea of weight training. So obviously, so, so my site got it focus, you know, I have, it's kind of like 50, 50, 50% is focused on weight loss and fat loss and, you know, things like that. And then the other half is just focused on weight training and building muscle. So, so, but the type, you know, the name kind of fits both mixed with Scientology weight loss aspect of it. Um, I kind of delved into that field. Um, because I, what, what had happened is I ended up landing a position as the, as the research director for a a program called 2020 lifestyles. Uh, this was back 2004, 2005. And, um, and what 2020 lifestyle is, is, is it's a, uh, um, weight management program, uh, a corporate weight management program. And, uh, mainly for Microsoft employees because, uh, Microsoft's, uh, insurance, they basically covered it as a benefit if you were obese. So mm-hmm. we treat like maybe around 400 uh, people per year and it was a pretty intense program. Uh, you know, they would meet with a dietitian once a week, meet with a personal trainer three days a week, meet with a behavioral therapist, I think once a week, uh, meet with a physician every five weeks. Um, and anyway, but the CEO of the company, uh, he made me the research director for that program. And so I started to delve a lot into the scientific literature on weight loss because one of my tasks, one of part of one of my job was to give lit reviews to the doctors and dietitians on staff. And so I would do research on various stuff like, you know, you know, a lot of the stuff I've written about or, or talked about in terms of NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, that actually, that first came about when I worked, when I was the research director for that program because I did some investigation into it. And so it kind of, you know, kind of took off from there. But uh, um, yeah, so I, I, I spent, you know, probably half of my job was just reading studies related to weight loss and fat loss and all that stuff. And so I, so that's, that's how I kind of fell into that niche, uh, right there, you know? So, so one of your beliefs that we strongly share is that adherence is the biggest predictor of success. How did you come to this belief? It's again, just based on the research, the research, um, the research is very clear in this. And actually there's one study that actually illustrates it quite well. I don't remember the authors. I know, I think it was published in JAMA, you know, the journal of the American medical association. Um, but basically what they did is they, they randomly assigned, uh, people to one of four different diets. Like one was a zone diet. One was an Atkins diet. One was the Ornish diet. And then I think there was a fourth one in there, maybe weight watchers or something. I don't remember what the fourth one was, but Um, and what they found was that one diet wasn't any better than the other one as far as the, 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 the weight loss results. Mm -hmm. Every diet was pretty much the same, equal to each other after a year. But what they did find is there was a strong relationship between how well someone stuck with the diet and how much weight they, and how much weight was lost. So, so the predictor of weight loss in that study wasn't the diet it was how well people adhered to whatever diet they were on. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's been a bunch of other studies, similar studies that have pretty much shown that uh, adherence is by 
by far the best predictor of how successful someone is going to be. You know, um, I don't care how perfect a diet seems on paper. If, if you cannot stick with it at all, it is not going to work for you. And, and fortunately, there's a lot of different types of dietary strategies that can work for people, you know. Um, um, regardless, it it's, has to be something that you can adhere to and sustain long term because um, otherwise, if you can't, you know, you're going to lose some weight and then you'll just gain it all back again. And so. So let's, let's dive further into this. What have you learned about adherence? Like what are the things that, what are the biggest hindrances to adherence? What is, what's actually keeping people from sticking to their diets? Um, well, I'd say one big obstacle is just the food environment itself. I mean, I mean, we are surrounded by energy dense, hyper palatable, highly rewarding food. I mean, we're bombarded by it, whether it's by TV commercials, you, uh, we have so much choices now at the grocery store, you go to work and your, your coworkers are bringing donuts. Um, you know, it's, it's like, you, and nowadays you don't even have to get up off the couch to order food. I mean, whether it's, whether it's Uber eats or whether it's, you know, Amazon fresh or whatever, you don't even have to, you, you, you literally have to don't do, have to do any work to get right. the food, <laughs> right? Like, like no work at all. And so there's a, it's, a, it's just kind of like this perfect storm of, of, of highly rewarding food that, that basically overrides our natural appetite regulation combined with, it's very easy to get. We don't have to ex basically don't have to expend any energy to obtain that food. Um, and you just have a recipe for an obesity epidemic. And, um, you know, um, you know, when you look at hunter gatherer societies where they have pretty much no obesity, um, you know, some key distinctions of why they don't have obesity is number one, they don't have the easy access to the hyper palatable energy dense food that we do. Um, what does that and mean? number two, when they, when they do get energy dense food, you know, let's say they kill an animal that's got a lot of fat on it or something like that. And that's very calorie dense. Um, they have to expend a lot of energy to get that food in the first place. Right. So, so there's a certain, there's a high degree of effort involved in getting the food. And unfortunately our Western society, we were, we've removed the effort component, um, and we're still supplying ourselves with the energy dense food component that our brains just love because our brains have not evolved to realize that food is readily available now. It's mm -hmm. like our brains are still are still like hunter gatherer brains. Um, you know, our, our brains value fat, our brains value sugar and carbs, our brains value salt. Um because those signify calories and you know if you're a hunter gatherer you want calories because you don't know when you're going to get your next meal right um well that's not a problem anymore but unfortunately our brains haven't evolved beyond that point so um so yeah i would say it's our food environment just makes things so difficult for people because we're trying to really we're trying to resist natural evolutionary aspects of our brain. Um, and actually I, re I highly recommend for any of your listeners, um, my friends, uh, Stefan Guyune. Yes. Yeah. A lot yeah. of what you're saying really sounds like him. Yeah. Um, his book, the hungry brain. I think if, if there's one book for anybody to read, to understand, um, eating and obesity and weight gain and stuff, it would be that book because, um, that really describes the whole problem in a nutshell mm -hmm. that, you know, um, it's, it's not, it's not specific, you know, like people have to blame certain things and <clears throat> are uh, in the foods we eat, you know, some people say, Oh, it's the sugar that's making us fat. And Oh no, it's the carbs or, you know, Oh no, it's the, um, I don't know. It's the artificial sweeteners or whatever people want, like to point a finger at. And really it's none of those things. Um, Re really, it's it's um, an interplay between what our brains value in terms of food and what's actually available to us, so readily available to us. So, yeah, I highly recommend his book. It's called The Hungry Brain. Uh, it's just it's an outstanding book. Um, really gives people a lot of insight into really what drives us to eat the amount of food that we do and why it's so hard for people to um, – 
to adhere to a diet in this food environment. Yeah. So. I've had Stefan on as well. And one of the most interesting things I found in his book was this idea of uh, palatability. And yeah. one, one of the things that he does in his own life is he's very conscious about how much salt and seasoning he uses. He's intentionally making his food a little less palatable, a little less tasty so that he's less likely to overeat. It's like so simple and such a powerful, yeah. powerful tool. Yeah. And, and there's a, and like you said, and he even talks about this in the book. I mean, uh, he talked about one example of, a, uh, and this was research done in the 1960s, I think, where they took obese people and, um, put them on a, like a bland liquid diet and it just wasn't very tasty or whatever. And they just spontaneously lost weight and they, and they didn't even, they said they weren't even really hungry. It's just because the diet just sucked. I mean, it was, yeah. just was boring, you know? And I'm not saying that's how everyone should start eating because, I mean, there's obviously, again, an adherence issue there, but, um, but it does reveal the idea that, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with having some tasty food, but, but maybe if you temper that just a little bit, you know, you can probably help yourself out a little bit. So mm. another thing that you said that I've never heard put quite like this is how big of a an effect our environment plays right the marketing the yeah just, i mean fuck the marketing <laughs> the marketing yeah. and, the, and the signs everywhere it's yeah. like if you want to quit smoking and you're only hanging around smokers how likely is it that you're going to be able to adhere Th that that's a perfect analogy there i mean that's basically what it's like it's like it's like you're a smoker and you're just constantly surrounded by smokers, not just part of the day, but all day. Yeah. Right. Like, like, like from the time you wake up, practically the time you go to bed, you're surrounded by smokers. I mean, right. that's, that's what people have to, are trying to overcome. And, and that's what just makes it so difficult. I mean, and we know how hard it is to quit smoking for people who actually aren't even surrounded by smokers, you mm -hmm. know? So, so just imagine, you know, just, you know, it's like exponential. I mean, that's just what, what's so hard about it. Now it doesn't mean it's impossible because there are people who are successful and it can be done, but, but it, it's very, it's very challenging. And there are, there's a number of steps that people kind of need to take, um, to help them kind of overcome those challenges. So. so we know that we can control our home environment, right? We yeah, can, that's we can take one. all of the shit out. We can put all of the healthiest stuff like front and center on the counters. Um, we can use all of the techniques in Stefan's book. How do, how do you have people start thinking about how to navigate the, the outside environment that they can't yeah, control? That's, that's, that's a hard one. And, and, um, um, there's a lot of different ways. And, and, and I think, it, you know, it has to be dealt with on an individual basis because, you know, um, each person's environment's a little bit different, but I mean, I'll just use some random examples. Uh, you know, let's say someone's going to a social event, like a wedding or something like that. Um, you know, things like that. You, usually what I have people do is there's different strategies you can use to get around that. You know, for example, you could, sometimes I'll just have someone, people even just have a protein shake before they go just to give them a little satiety before they go. So it's like, so you're just not, you, you don't quite have the same temptation as if you're going with a feeling of satiety. Mm -hmm. um, you can also use techniques like uh, time restricted feeding, you know, intermittent fasting, time restricted, you know, feeding. So to where you, you basically just narrow your feeding window in the day. Um, you know, uh, so rather than having a breakfast, lunch and dinner, and you know, you're going to be at a social event for dinner, you just skip breakfast, have a, have a slightly bigger lunch that'll carry you over. And you actually may even still be full by the time that dinner comes around and maybe you won't need to eat as much. And if you do go over that dinner, well, you gave yourself some calorie room because you skipped breakfast, you know? So, um, there, there's various techniques people can use to try to manage the food environment. I, I, I say preparation too, just goes a long way. Um, you know, it, like if you have a really tough work environment, um, you know, m trying to prepare your own food at home and make sure you're bringing it to work and, and things like that can help, um, you know, uh, and also um, trying to stay as highly active as possible because, um, and the research is very clear on this, you know, people, you know, people have, uh, all the people who have been very successful at long-term weight maintenance, so they've lost weight and they've kept it off 
the data is overwhelming that all these people are very highly physically active and, and, and that has a number of positive benefits. Number one, it, it gives you a buffer. So, because, you know, anyone who's, you know, dieted for a while and they've lost weight and everything, usually what happens is you start to eat and your calorie intake starts to creep up again. Um, as you kind of relax, you know, um, but what a high physical activity level does is it kind of gives you a little buffer against that, you know? Um, and also there's, um, something called energy flux, which is, um, what is meant by how much energy you're taking in versus how much is coming out and, and the, the amounts that are coming in and out. So like a low energy flux would be something like I'm not eating very much, but I'm also very inactive, right? Um, so perhaps I'm still at maintenance, right? You know, I'm, I'm in energy balance, but, uh, but my energy flux is low versus a high energy flux is my, my physical activity is very high. My calorie intake is high, but I'm still in energy balance. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's, there's evidence that it's better to be in a high energy flux. Your body does a better job of regulating appetite and all those things when you're in a high energy flux versus a low energy flux. So that's another reason why staying very physically active is very, very helpful people to people who have lost weight and are, and are trying to keep it off. Interesting. So. Do you ever recommend that, you know, that lady that brings in the donuts to work every day, do you ever recommend people to punch her in the face? <laughs> <laughs> it's like she's bringing heroin I'll into to the my, office, I'll add man. That to my, my list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, here's what I want you to do. Go go up to Sally and I want you to <laughs> greet her like you always would. Pretend like nothing's happened and then I just want you to clock her. <laughs> so let, let's talk about diet wars. Human beings love to be a part of tribes, but yeah. how do you think this affects people's ability to adhere to the diet of their choice? Um, I think it can be a kind of a double-edged sword. And maybe... maybe uh, define what diet wars means before you, before you answer. Yeah. So, so something like diet wars would be like, you know, you've got people on the carnivore diet. Oh, our diet's the best. Everyone's got to do this or vegans. No, everyone's got to be vegan, you know, or no, you got to be low carb. Everybody's got to be low carb. You know, it, it, it kind of becomes this religious like tribe, like, uh, th th like you said, and, and people, people, they end up kind of wrapping their whole identity around their diet and their lifestyle. And, um, and I think it's a double-edged sword. I, th I think it can have positive benefits in, in that it can help sometimes people stick with something because you kind of develop that sense of ide identity around this typical diet and, and it almost be kind of becomes who you are. And that might help with adherence, but what comes with that, though, I think is a very negative aspect in that um, if, let's say, for some reason, suddenly, let's say it's not working for you, well, then what do you do? Do you, you like you're so tied up in your identity with this diet, you're like, well, I just need to try harder with this particular diet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a perfect example is, is people that go low carb, they go low carb, they lose weight. They think great. They start identifying themselves as low carb. They start telling, preaching to people, "Hey, you got to do low carb." Blah blah blah. Well, suddenly they stop losing weight and they start to struggle. And and so what they'll do is they think, "Well, geez, if low carb was good, that just means I got to go even lower carb." You know, I was doing 50 grams a day. Now I just got to go down to 20. That doesn't work. And then they're like, "Okay, well." well, that means I got to go down to zero, you know, and, and it still doesn't work. And, and so what happens is you become so wrapped up in, in kind of this religious, like, um, identification with this diet. Um, you, you actually kind of lose a sense of what number one, why the diet worked in the first place. Um, and you also lose a sense of, of, of the fact that actually there are other approaches that can work, you know? Um, so, so that's why I think it can be a double edged sword for people, you know? Yeah. And then people also have the consistency bias, right? They've told all of these people for so long that they're low carb. And yeah. now not only are they having to overcome all of the things you just said, but then they're, they're afraid they're going to look bad to their friends because they're, yeah. incon they're inconsistent. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So it's an interesting 
psychological phenomena. Like, like, like when someone comes to me and says they want to do low carb or something like that, like I, I never discourage anyone from any particular dietary approach unless it's a, obviously something super dangerous or something. Mm-hmm. But, um, um, but I will always remind the person that I, again, I will teach the person about adherence. Um, uh, I, me, I'm a big fan of more flexible approaches. So I try to instill the idea of flexibility even within whatever dietary approach you've chosen, I think you can choose to have a lot of flexibility in it. And, 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 and the, the research is very clear that, that people who are more flexible in their approach actually have much better long-term success than people who are very rigid in their approach, you know? Um, and uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think we, people with rigid mentalities that kind of have that all or nothing thinking. So if they screw up, they think they've blown everything and they'll, you know, kind of sab- self-sabotage or things like that. Um, you know, um, or they, they start to develop a sense of guilt around food. You know, they ate something that, that wasn't low carb and like, oh my God, I, I, you know, they feel guilty about it. And mm-hmm. um, I, I think it's really, really important that people learn that how important a flexible approach is. Um, everybody that I know that has had long-term success uses a flexible approach. Um, and the research shows that too. I mean, a, a flexible approach wins hands down over any sort of rigid approach. That's why I don't like diets that completely eliminate certain foods or label foods as good or bad Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, certain foods are somehow off limits. Um, I think, I, I think that those type of dietary approaches kind of number one, reinforce kind of a bad relationship with food. Um, and they also remove that flexibility that you really need for, for, uh, for very good long-term success. Yeah. So. Especially again, to bring it back to the environment to, in order to deal with, or in order to fit into this environment that we're in, in society, I think we have to have some flexibility because there, yeah. there are billions of dollars being spent to have us buy these things that if we eat nothing but the highly palatable stuff, we're going to be fat and really unhappy, right? There's amazing marketing being done and there are, there's going to be times that we're going to eat those things. So if that's not baked into our plan, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. Yeah. 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 So I don't know where I pulled this quote from you, but you said only 17% of Americans are able to maintain a 10% weight loss after one year. Can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So there was a study done. Uh, I don't, uh, I, th- I wrote about it on my website. I, I don't remember the authors of the year, but yeah, they, they basically, um, tracked people who had lost, um, at least 10% of the weight and then whether they kept it off and only 17, and these were just us citizens, only 17% of those people were able to keep even just a 10% weight loss, which is, you know, is, is an okay weight loss. It's not a huge amount of weight loss, but it, you know, it's typically around that threshold where, where you t- start to see the health benefits and stuff. And even 17% of people only, you know, um, or I should say, uh, 83% of people weren't even, weren't able to do that. Um, so it, I think it just illustrates the challenges that people are up against. Um, you know, now at the same time, I don't want people to look at that number and say, Oh my God, it's just impossible. There's no way I'm going to do this. Um, it is possible. Um, it's just more, it's, it's more to try to just show people that it's going to be challenging, that it's not going to be easy. Um, but at the same time it it can be done and, and, you know, you can learn from the people who are successful and try to mimic some of the qualities or mimic some of the things they've done to be successful, um, to maximize your chances of success. I mean, and, I mean, that's what the whole, you know, the national weight control registry is all about. You know, it's a, for, for those of you who don't know, it's a national database, um, of people who have lost at least 30 pounds and kept it off for at least a year. Um, and, and scientists have used this database to kind of study what makes long-term weight maintenance a success. You know, what are the characteristics that all these people share and it's actually, a, I think, a very good data set to draw some conclusions from because there's a lot of things that these people have in common. Um, I've already talked about one, you know, the very high physical activity levels. That mm-hmm. was one. 
Um, and so uh, I, I do want people to know it, it can be done. It, it's very, it's difficult, you know, and you're gonna have setbacks. Um, you're, you're, you're basically trying to overcome biology, um, and, and, the, and the, the, the kind of overwhelming environment. Um, but it, it can be done, you know, it certainly is not impossible. Um, and, uh, you know, people, it's just a matter of finding the tools that are going to work for you, um, and being able to apply those tools consistently for an extended period of time. And that may even mean things like medication, stuff like, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friends with Dr. Spencer Nadolsky. He's treated a lot of, uh, people who are overweight and obese. I mean, he's, he's number one on lifestyle change. Um, but he's also not against, um, using medication to help some people that may need it to help with their appetite or something like that, you know? So, so don't be afraid to go to a physician and, and, you know, if for someone who is, uh, if you are struggling, uh, with your weight, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, resorting to some pharmacological approaches as well. You know, obviously you need to talk to a doctor about it, but, uh, um, you know, use as many tools as you're at your disposal as you have to, to maximize your chances, you mm-hmm. know? So, yeah, I think what, like with any long-term change, whether that be weight loss or something else, it seems like we have to find a way to continue doing the things that got us from A to B. We have to find a way to continue doing those things, right? Yeah, so we yeah. have to find a way to continue uh, or to maintain motivation. And one yeah. of the one of the best ways to do that is to surround yourself with people that are living that same lifestyle. Uh, bring, yeah. Bringing it back to the smoker idea, you could have the best, you know, anti-smoking plan on the planet. You could be medicated, but if you're spending all of your time with people with that, that mentality and you're smelling smoke all the time, it's going to be yeah. really hard to stay off of it. If you're spending time with people that are fit, they're moving around all day long, you know, they're going to the gym multiple days a week, they're watching what they eat, they're living the type of life that you want to live. It's almost inevitable that you live that lifestyle yeah. and reach your goals and maintain your goals. Yeah. And I think too, uh, uh, um, especially initially, uh, um, it, it becomes about trying to establish habits. Mm-hmm. Um, because one of the things about motivation is that motivation is very fickle and like, um, uh, and I'm going to tell you right now, um, even the most fit people have, have a lot of, you know, have a lot of times where they're not motivated, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, there are, you know, I've been, I love, you know, I've, I've been weight training now for 20 plus years. I've been in the fitness industry for 20 plus years, whatever. And you know what? Sometimes I'm, I'm tired of it. I mean, I'll just be flat out honest with you. Sometimes I'm tired of it. Sometimes I don't want to go to the weight room. Sometimes I, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of times where I have no motivation. Um, but for me, it's become such a habit. It's like an ingrained habit. Um, and that's what kind of keeps me going. Um, and there's also other things that are a factor, you know, um, I think sometimes this is underappreciated, but sometimes fear of loss or fear of, of, of losing what something you've worked so hard to obtain. Right. So for me, for example, one of the things that keeps me going to the gym is again, I started off, uh, as a very, very skinny guy. Um, now I'm, I'm not some bodybuilder by any means now, but compared to what I used to be, I'm, I'm carrying, you know, definitely a lot more muscle than I used to have. If I were to totally stop weight training, all that stuff that I've worked hard for is eventually going to go away. Right. And so that's one of the things that keeps me going is just that fear of losing that, mm-hmm. you know, cause I don't want to, I've, I've worked so hard for it. I don't want to lose it. And I think too, I think someone who's lost a bunch of weight. I think maybe that fear of weight regain can actually be a little bit of a good thing because it can keep you with those habits and, and it can help you to, through the times where you're not quite motivated. Um, and I think the longer you do it for, the more ingrained it becomes. Um, and, and it becomes to a point where if you do kind of, you know, let's say you kind of, let's say, I don't like to use the term fall off the wagon because that kind of makes, it kind of implies on or off. But, 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 you know, let's say you, you do hit a, a rut where you're, 
you're not physically active and you're not going to the gym or whatever your, your preferred activity is, um, you start to miss it, you know, after a period of time, you know, because you've done it for so long. And I think that's why establishing those habits is so important because, um, I, cause I know for me, um, if I do have some time off for, for whatever reason, I mean, even this Christmas break, I, I, I got to the gym maybe two or three times and maybe about two or three weeks, you know, which is very unusual for me. And I was just had to do for a variety of reasons. Um, um, but I'm at a point now I'm like, okay, I want to, I want to, I, wanna, I don't want this to continue, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so I think the habit part of it is, is really, really important. Um, because again, motivation, uh, even, even the fittest people are not motivated all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important for people to understand. It's not just about motivate, you know, motivation gets you started. It gets you going, especially if you've something you've, you know, but motivation isn't what's going to keep you going over years and years. You got to find other ways to keep going. So, yeah, I'm interviewing this guy named John Asaraf later. He was in the, he was one of the people in the movie, the secret. <clears throat> and he talks about in, in his life, he had this experience where one of his mentors asked if he was interested or if he was committed. And he said, if you're interested, you'll do all of the things that are convenient. You'll do it when they're comfortable for you, when you're motivated yeah. to do them. If you're committed, you will do these things no matter what, right? You make a vow and you're committed to taking these actions despite how you feel on any given day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's so, that's so true. I mean, like I said, there are days where I just don't feel like going to work out. Like yeah. I just don't feel like it. But if I, but again, if I just only went when I felt like it, I would never go. I'd probably never go or I'd go very rarely, you know, uh, you know, it's like, uh, um, I think that's why having a plan is important because, because if you have a plan in place, you know, rather than just being kind of willy nilly about it, where you have a specific plan. I mean, even if you just say, you know what, I'm going to go to the gym on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday this week. And that's your plan. You're going to be more likely to do that than if you think I'm, I want to go to the gym three days this week. But you haven't chosen which days and you haven't really made any specific plan. You're just it's just kind of vague. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's even research to support that. There was actually a, I think I did an Instagram post about this one time a long time ago. But uh, they had this there was this one study um, that uh, um, they had uh, a couple groups of people um, and uh, um one group basically had to kind of kind of commit, like you said, they had to say, write out a plan and say, I'm going to go exercise on blah, blah, blah. They had to write a specific plan for exercising that week. And the, the other uh, group was just encouraged to be physically active or whatever. And the group that actually had the specific plan, like did way better. I mean, just it was like light years better than the group that that didn't have a specific plan laid out. So Um, so yeah, there is something to having a commitment, um, and a plan to do something because you're more likely to actually follow through with it. Right. You know? So let's talk a little bit about thinking about your thinking as we start to start to wrap up. Um, one of the most common thinking errors that human beings have is the confirmation bias. You know, we yeah. think our we think our partner is mad at us and like every little thing he or she does, like they look at us the wrong way, that's just confirmation that they're angry for us when they might it might have nothing to do with that, right? Yeah. And this shows up in every area of our life. Um, can you talk about this a little bit and how that applies to uh, weight loss? Yeah. Yeah. So confirmation bias, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of research on it. Um, I mean, geez, I mean, one place you see it all the time is politics, for example, it's, it's basically this tendency to confirm, to, to only seek confirmatory evidence for what we already believe and to dismiss any evidence that contradicts what we already believe. Um, so, um, and it was kind of interesting. There was actually a research study done on it. Um, I wish I could remember the details. It was actually a really interesting study in terms of politics. So it was like they, um, they had students, I think, oh no, no, it was like, um, uh, what was it? I think they had students that they were presented with research that I think either supported or contradicted the death penalty or something like that. I, I don't remember exactly what it was. And, but they didn't, um, 
they, they presented, I think two groups with the exact same study. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I think the group that be- believed in the death penalty saw the study as supporting their belief. And the group that didn't believe in the death penalty saw the, took the same study and saw it as supporting their belief. Like wow. it was just kind of, I don't remember exact. I wish I could, I'm not doing it justice. It was, but it was really interesting. It just, it perfectly illustrated the concept of confirmation bias that we will only see what we want to support what we already believe and just completely dismiss anything that may contradict what we believe. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, how that relates to, to fitness and weight loss. Um, I I think you see it a lot in terms of the tribalism again. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, someone who really believes hardcore and low carb, you know, they're going to see any evidence pro low carb, you know, um, any evidence that's pro low carb, no matter how weak it is, no matter how poor that evidence is, they're going to accept with open arms and any evidence that's against low carb, no matter how good the evidence is, they're going to reject it, you Mm -hmm, know? mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I think that's also a perfect example of confirmation bias when you have different standards of evidence based on whether something supports what you believe or not. I mean, I see this all the time, you know, if something supports what you believe, you're willing to accept the flimsiest of evidence on it. Mm -hmm. And if something contradicts what you believe, you're suddenly your standards of evidence go like light years (laughs) higher. Right. 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 Um, you know, and, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's just, you know, it, it, it just, it happens all the time. I mean, even, even happened, uh, this is more kind of weight training related, but, uh, you know, a couple years back, maybe a year and a half ago or whatever, um, I was involved publishing a study on, on training volume on what was hypertrophy with Brad Schoenfeld and some other people. And it was kind of a controversial study because we saw these benefits of these really high training volumes. And this one fitness guy, Lyle, uh, McDonald, like he, uh, uh, basically started tearing apart the study and then started, he's a a uh, passionate guy. (laughs) Yeah. Started tearing apart the study and then started holding up these other studies as examples of good studies. But those studies had the same flaws that our study did. Like, like, so basically what was happening is, is it was confirmation bias. Our study contradicted what he already believed. So he started to nitpick every detail of the study, but then completely ignored those same details that were present were present in all the other studies Very that supported what he believed. Right. And that was a perfect <clears throat> example of it. Like, you know, it's where you start again, when you change your standards of evidence based on whether something supports you or not, you know, and, and I just, I think it's really, I think it's important. It's, I think it's human nature. I, again, it's, supported by scientific research and stuff. Um, but I think if you can develop a self-awareness of it and just constantly ask yourself the question, am I being consistent in how I'm evaluating things? Um, when it comes to something that perhaps supports what I believe or doesn't support what I believe, because Mm -hmm. if you're not, then that's a problem, you know, and I think it's an important question people should ask themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think having this vocabulary is really helpful, right? To know that this is a thing called confirmation bias and then to start to watch your thoughts when you're making a a decision and especially an important one, start to watch how, like, what are your criteria for making that decision and how are you actually going about doing that? And I think you can develop um, a lot of nuance and self-awareness as you're saying. Yeah. So I I know that you're really passionate about trading stocks and it actually sounds like you're pretty confident about it. Um, why is it that stock traders or investors put so much focus on thinking about their thinking? Um, I, I think it's, it's a, a, another example of, of confirmation bias will kill you if you are an investor or a trader. Mm-hmm. I mean, it will, will literally destroy you in terms of financially. I mean, at the extremes, at least, I mean, Um, because if you get so caught up in thinking that you're right about a particular investment thesis or trading thesis and that trade or investment goes against you and it continues to go against you, um, you can lose a lot of money if you don't, if you're not willing to accept that you're wrong, you know, and every good investor and every good trader that I know 
they are willing to accept very quickly when they're wrong about something, you know, um, when the evidence suggests that they need to change their thinking about whatever their, their Mm -hmm. idea is. Um, um, it's a very important skill set to have, um, and to develop because you, you won't survive if you don't, Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have that, that mentality. Um, so, um, you, you just, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what, what it comes down to. Got it. Do you find so, that investor, so investors have to be able to admit when they're wrong, right? For their own self-preservation. Do you find that yeah. that correlates to other areas of investors life? Like in relationships, are they, are they more, uh, ready to accept when they're wrong in, in conversations I, or in relationships? I have no idea that that's a really good question. I, I really think that's a good high level question for really anything. It's like if you're someone who's willing to accept your wrong in one area, are you going to be just as willing to accept your wrong in another area that that's a really good question. Uh, and I don't know if, I don't know. I mean, I will know that I went through some of the same struggles that other traders go through. Um, getting emotionally invested into a trade and not willing to cut my losses when I was wrong. I mean, that's, that's why I had a major blow up back in 2014 because I took a massive position and, in, in a in something that I was convinced I would be right on. Mm-hmm. And when it started to go against me, I, I wasn't willing to, to cut and pull the plug until it was kind of too late. Yeah. So I, basically until my broker forced me to stop. So, um, And yet here I was a scientist, you know, who had been pretty good, at least in the realms of science, of of learning to accept when I was wrong. But I hadn't really taken that thinking enough into the trading realm yet. I'm 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 very different now. um, But I have a feeling it's probably that's that I think it does carry over somewhat. But I think probably only to a point. I think there's probably some compartmentalization Mm -hmm. still with it. Um, I, I will say I, I, I think science being a scientist has, has really helped me though. I am more willing to admit when I'm wrong about things like when it comes to politics or things like that, you know? Um, so I will say it has carried over into other aspects of my life, whether that's true for other people. I, I can't say I can only speak for myself, mm-hmm. but, but it, it's, it's, it, It'd be an interesting, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some research on it. I, I don't know, but it'd be an interesting to know if, you know, are, are, you know, if someone's willing to basically accept that their hypothesis about whatever it is, is wrong, you know, are they more willing to do that in other areas of their life? It's, it's a really good question. What habits, practices, uh, exercises, rituals have been helpful for you to help you think clearly? Um, to me, it's just been, it's been a lot of self-talk, like just constantly asking myself questions and then trying to step back. Um, uh, and, tr- and it's not easy to, to try to remove myself from any emotions I might have regarding a particular, you know, whatever, whatever it is. I, I'm not saying that's, easy to do. Um, and I'm not saying I'm always successful with it, but I do find myself like, it's almost like an active conscious process on my part where, um, I have to, you know, consistently do that. And then what happens is over time, it starts to become more natural. Mm -hmm. I think really just like with any, any sort of habit, even any type of external habit, you know, we talked about fitness habits or nutrition habits or whatever, I think I think you can do the same thing with your mind and develop certain mental habits. Um, if you do it often enough, um, I think you can even change how you think um, over a period of time. So, yeah, it's it's uh, what's a I don't know what a good analogy is, but the the way that th- thinking works is we're just like create we we've created a groove we cr- we've created a really deep groove of certain neural pathways to have a, the same loop of thought happen over and over and over and over. And if we think something new in that area over and over and over and over and over, we'll strengthen that connection. And that's the thought that starts to pop into our head spontaneously yeah. now. Yeah. What are your 
favorite resources that you recommend for people that want to think more clearly? Books, resource, uh, uh, courses, seminars, anything? Yeah, I, um, I'll just basically name off the books that have been most influential to me. Um, number one was that book, How We Know What Isn't So by Thomas Gilovich. That was a really big book that was influential to me. Um, another book, uh, some of Michael, uh, some of Michael Shermer's work, um, uh, what, um, God, what was his name? Um, I don't remember the name of it. He's got one really famous book and I, and, and I don't remember the name of it off my head. Um, Is but it Michael his, Shermer. Huh? It's Shermer. Yeah. Shermer. S H E R M E R. Got it. Um, uh, I don't remember. Um, you know, the late Carl Sagan, his book, uh, uh, science is a candle in the dark or something like that. I think that was a very influential book on me. Um, so, you know, those, those three books were kind of really big, uh, I would say influences on me. Um, and then one book that was really influential for me, um, in terms of, that really affected me in, in terms of uh, conspiratorial thinking. Because um, that's another problem people have. People tend to think in terms of conspiracies and things mm-hmm. like that. And there's a number of psychological reasons why. Is um, um, uh, Gerald Posner's book, Case Closed. Okay. Um, and it's actually a book on the JFK assassination. And so many people think there was some big conspiracy to, to assassinate JFK and all this stuff. And, and, and his book pretty much just lays out it, why it's all bullshit. Uh-huh. <laughs> why, why? Nope. There was just a lone shooter. He was just a crazy guy and he shot JFK and, and all this other conspiracy stuff is just complete nonsense. But that book was really influential to me. Um, because again, it, it, it actually really helped me in terms of critical thinking and also helped me in how I view conspiracy theories in general and things like that. So that was actually another Interesting. really good book. Uh, it is actually probably one of my favorite books of all time. It's wow. a, a very, it, it, it was, it was one of, it was one of those books that I couldn't put like, you know, people will say, Oh, I had a book and I couldn't put it down. Yeah. And I've almost never had a book like that. But that was one book I literally couldn't put down. Like for whatever reason, I just kept wanting to continue to read it. And I remember I read it within a couple of days or something like, like, uh, you know, so, so yeah. So I, I, I recommend people check that book out. It's a very good, uh, book on, on evaluating evidence and, and, and evaluating conspiracy theories and the problems with conspiracy theories and things like that. So that's, that sounds really useful. Um, it can be it can be really frightening to hear all of the conspiracy theories coming up today. You know, it's like we have yeah. no idea who to trust and um, how to evaluate the truth behind those and not yeah. get rattled and not go down a rabbit hole of being really, um, I don't know, scared and, and sad about the future of the world. That sounds yeah, super yeah. useful. Well, James, dude, this was uh, this was a pleasure, man. You're you're very down to earth, and I just love the way that you communicate all of your wisdom. Uh, it's very clear, and I really appreciate your time, dude. Yeah, thanks for having me. It, it, it was fun. I, I love the topics we talked about because it's it's not the usual topics that people ask me about. You know, mm-hmm. usually people ask me about body comp testing or neat, you know, or or insulin, you know, kind of the three things that I tend to be kind of famous for. And, right. And it's, it's, it's refreshing to talk about some different topics other than those topics. Oh, yeah, so. Man. so where can people keep up with you and find out more about what you offer at Weightology? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my website is weightology.net. Um, and I've got uh, got a research review for anyone who's interested in kind of the research on on muscle gain or fat loss. Um, I've, you know, I, I, I have coaching, you know, online coaching. I've got uh, lots of free articles on there and I'm actually going to be even releasing more free articles this come, you know, I'm, I'm actually gonna be shooting to, to release maybe like one major free article per month, um, uh, on some major topics. So, um, so yeah, people can, uh, check me out there and all my social media accounts, uh, you can find them there as well. So awesome. Thank you, James. Yeah. Thanks. 
Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Your journey towards better fitness continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com to connect with Michael and his guests. Access links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive to podcast listeners. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com.